So yeah, I, I work at Square. And a month ago, my team released um, something called the Square Reader SDK. And in doing that, we learned a lot about APIs. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So we released the Square Reader SDK. What is that? Uh, if, you're, if you have good eyes, you'll notice that this is, this is actually uh, iOS code behind. This is uh, Swift, not, nothing related to Android. It's just that we had this asset, and it looks nice. So. Um, so the Square Reader SDK is an SDK that connects to Square Payment hardware uh, and allow you to build a custom point of sale app. Uh, so if you really want to see what it looks like, like what the end result is, you could go to the Square Boost right there. You probably saw it. There's a photo boost where you can uh, pay a dollar, but not really, uh, and then it takes a picture and then it prints it. Um, just to kind of uh, see who has uh, seen the photo boost uh, or the Square Boost in here. A few people. We can do we can do better, uh, but that's not the point. I'm not here to talk about the photo boost. This is what it looks like, by the way. Uh, so it, I happen to also be the author of Lee Canary, and so I use the logo everywhere I can. So it puts a Lee Canary logo on your head. Uh, that's about it. Um, so you pay a dollar to get leaks. It's kind of the the idea. But. Let's go back to the subject of the talk. So Square is known for making uh, great products, physical products, uh, apps, uh, but also pretty uh, well known for open source, right? Who's used uh, an open source um, Square library uh, before? Woo! <laughs> That's exciting, almost everybody. Uh, so when we decided to build this new AP, uh, SDK, we thought, well, we should build a, a really good um, API. Uh, we can't build something bad, right? Um, you could still say, like, well, why do you need a good API? What's the point, anyway? Uh, so what happens when you build a bad API? The first thing that happens is someone is going to try to use your API, and they're going to have bugs in their code. They're going to use it incorrectly. And it's your fault. Your API is bad. The second thing that happens is the developers are going to be angry. They're going to be frustrated. Um, and that's, that's not a good thing, because then they'll think of your company and your products as something bad. They'll be, I'll be associated to negative emotions, and you don't want that either. So the spirit should really be build APIs that people will remember, like, oh, you remember the good times? It was so nice when we had this API. That's, that's the idea anyway. Uh, I don't know if that's what we built. I'm not going to say that we built that, uh, but that's kind of like what we're aiming for. So today we're going to look at, uh, in, uh, in more details, a little bit more details, what, how we build the Reader SDK API and how we changed it. But the, the, it's not about that SDK. It's really about the principles that are behind and how we looked at them. So let's take a step back. Why do we write code? Like, we're all developers here. Why do we do that? Um, you know, maybe a couple years back, I would have said, well, it's clear we want to get the machine to do something, so we're writing instructions for the machine to execute, right? But if that was the case, we would still be writing assembly today. It's not just that. Um, we're writing code for someone to read later. And that someone is a, maybe you, maybe another developer in the future. Uh, and they're going to be reading that code. And so that's why, that's why we're all like happy to move to Kotlin. That's why we're always looking for better ways to write code. And the fact that it executes and that there is a machine that's running that code, it's almost like not that important at the end of the day. Um, so. Knowing that, what is a good API? I think it's just two things. A, it's intuitive, which means when I see it for the first time, I'm like, I know how to use it. Every time I want to do something new, I don't have to struggle for, for a while. And the second thing is, it gets me to write maintainable code. So the code that I write that uses that API is not going to be look terrible, and it's not going to be hard to maintain. There's a great uh, quote from uh, Josh Blush. ABIs should be easy to use and hard to misuse. The easy to use part is interesting. Um, you'd say, well, you think, you know, oh, is that objective? Can we say this is easy to use, this is not? Not really. Like, babies don't know how to code, right? You have to learn a certain amount of things so that something becomes easy. So when you say something is easy to use, you have to think about the context. Who's the person who's going to use that thing? And what do they know? And if they know enough and they, they can relate to that, then it's going to be easy. Um, so in, in our, for one example of that was that uh, we were targeting junior developers. Uh, um, in this room, there's a lot of very senior and very developers. We're trying to aim for people who just came out of bootcamp, someone who barely knows Android and can start building with it. 
So that was one of the reasons why uh, we went with Java instead of Kotlin as an API, because as much as we wanted to write Kotlin, we thought uh, Java is right now at the moment easier for people to approach. It might change in the future, but that's how it is today. Uh, and then the second part of this code is hard to misuse. Um, it really means, it's, A, it's hard to make a mistake. But if I make a mistake, I'm going to know about it and very quickly, and it's going to be very easy to fix. So looking at the, the SDK, we kind of have three parts for it. Uh, so this is a sample app, and the first thing is like you need to authorize the SDK. You need to be able to uh, use the hardware, so you need to authorize. Uh, it's an asynchronous call. It's going to succeed or fail. Second thing you do is, and that's going to be a bit surprising maybe for you, is you start a UI flow to connect the reader. You don't have access to APIs that connect directly to the reader. You start a UI flow, and then the, the customer can like mess with the reader, and then you get a result eventually. So on Android, that's an activity. And the last thing is you start a payment flow, and then you do payments, and you get a result. Um, so what does the API look like? So pretty uh, simple. You obtain a, a client from a static method, and you call login on it with a code and a callback. And that's how you authorize the SDK. Uh, to start the flow, well, uh, you're all Android, uh, engineers, right? You all know that you, you want to start some UI that, that's somewhere else. You start an activity. So we create an intent for that activity. And we start an activity for results. And then when we get a result, we have to override on activity results and deal with the request code and like uh, whether the result code was good or not. And then we need to parse the intent, put that into, uh, transfer that into, uh, convert that into an object. Uh, and uh, then we can start the transaction flow, and it's the same deal. It's like I'm starting, I'm ending. Uh, I have to manage, convert different, the intent to a different thing, whether it's a success or an error. So is this like a really good API? Who thinks this is a really good API? Now, no one wants to raise their hand, obviously. <laughs> uh, when we did this, we were, <laughs> Zach is like, yeah, it's really good. Uh, when we did this, we were actually, you know, we were pretty happy about it. We were writing features moving forward. Uh, but then we took a step back. Uh, let's talk about some of the issues. The first one is that there's a callback. So if, you, if, you're Android, if you're writing Android, you know that the lifecycle is hard, right? You've known that for years. Uh, and that when you do this, if you do this in an activity, if you write a call, like, add a callback in an activity, your callback may be called after the activity is destroyed. You may be leaking the activity instance. Leak Canary can help with that. But still, um, the nature, like when you're starting writing Android, you're putting everything in an activity, and then you, you end up creating leaks. Uh, that's not great. Uh, it's really easy to make a mistake. Of course, you have architecture components now, and they help. But someone who starts Android might not be at, e at ease with that just yet. Um, and so it should be the goal of an API to really uh, think about how people are going to use it and make that part easy. You can't say, well, you didn't write the code correctly, so it's your fault. No, it's your API. You have to think about that. Uh, in our when we ship this in alpha, our documentation has a, had this as an example, and then there was text under it that said, uh, but don't do this for real. Like you, you have, you know, in a real production app, you have to handle lifecycle. And you know, like the rest is left to you. Like Figure it out. Um, that, that's kind of a hint that something was wrong. Uh, I really like this other quote from Just Blush. Example code should be exemplary. Uh, so when you write example code, you should write it like you're going to ship that app and you're going to maintain it for years. Because what's going to happen is people are going to copy paste that code over and over and over again. And if you make any simplification with a comment like, don't do this in real applications, people are going to do it anyway. So uh, yeah, example code should be exemplary. And that was a new rule for us. And we decided, OK, every simple app, we have to write it as we would write our own applications. And that really, uh, you know, the bar was really high. OK, so another uh, interesting thing here, on activity result. I don't really like that API. Uh, it's like, oh, if this int is equals to this constant, then maybe check for these other ints uh, and parse this intent. We don't know what's in there, but we think it's that thing, and then like magic. Uh, it's really easy to make mistakes. Uh, there's some inconsistency here because uh, if you think about, there, there was a callback API right before for login, but this is kind of an async API as well uh, because I'm starting a UI flow and then later I get a result. Uh, so why is it different? Well, because Android, but still kind of not great. Um, 
And one minor thing, uh, uh, the errors was, were all like listed in one enum. So whatever you were doing, you were getting one of these values. So here, uh, maybe the, uh, you know, the reader settings would get you two possible errors and the transaction would get you three possible errors. But it was all in one enum, which meant you had to remember which values would go for each operation. Not great. And finally, and that's an interesting one, uh, all the methods were on one interface. Uh, which sounds great, you know, everything's in one place, that's easy to find, I know where to look, but then every time I try to do something, I have to read every single one of them, like, uh, do I want it? No, I don't, uh, I don't know. Uh, so it's kind of confusing. Um, there's been uh, UX research done on that and how uh, essentially something called complexity. Uh, so one of the ways to measure complexity of the code is, uh, or an API is, how long does it take to perform an action for someone who Maybe you haven't used the API before, or then how long does it take to, per to perform it again once they've done it once? Um, and so they did all these studies, and it, it shows interesting things, like I think it's, it's a linear complexity for the number of methods, so every method that you add will increase the time it takes to do an action because you're scanning through it until you find the one that you want. Um, so I did, that's why we try to limit uh, methods and structure things. Um, and then another thing that's kind of funny, uh, login was lowercase g and log out was, oh, sorry, like lowercase i and log out was uppercase. Uh, completely inconsistent. Uh, you know, maybe say, yeah, I log in, but I log out. I don't know. It was just a mistake that we had made. Uh, it doesn't really make sense. So, not super happy with the API. Like, nah, I, no, not great. So, what, if, what is one of the, I've used that word a few times, uh, one of the requirements of uh, an intuitive API? It's consistency. All right, so if you're humans, you probably immediately notice that there's a cat here amongst all of the dogs, uh, and you, you immediately identify that cat as somehow special. Um, so humans are pattern matchers, right? We're really good at detecting differences, but also uh, doing pattern matching, and that's where when our brain goes kind of on uh, automatic mode, and that's where uh, intuition kind of comes in. Um, so it's really important to have consistency because consistency allows you to pattern match and you kind of know how to do it and you just do it again and again and again. Um, and the idea is once I've learned a part of the system, I can figure out the rest is probably just all the same. Uh, so there are different kind of consistencies. One of them is domain consistencies. Uh, if you've heard of, uh, I think it's DDD, domain driven design, it's like, whole, like there's a whole like world of things over there, people talking about domain. I'm not gonna dive into that. But there's simple things you can do, like find what the best words are for your API. Uh, and I'm not talking about technical things like callbacks and stuff, but like the, the, the domain, like payments. Um, it's actually really hard. And the really important thing is, it's not about the right word, it's not about the correct word, it's about the words that the developer know or will know after reading your documentation. Um, so one example of that is uh, big decimal. They love big words. Uh, it's not the worst, but when I look at the big decimal API, I see add, and I can add an og end, and I can subtract a subtract end. I had never heard that word before, I'm sorry, uh, before I read it in big decimal. And I don't really need to know what it means to add something. I just want to add something to another thing. And it's not a big, 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 not a, not a super big deal because it's a parameter name, but still, when I go and read this API, I might just pause and be like, oh, Am I doing this right? This sounds complicated. I'm just adding two values. It's crazy. Uh, so the point of, a, of an API, and that's very important, the point of an API is not to teach you. You're not making an API to teach people concepts. Um, so yeah, that's something to think about. Um, one of the examples for us was we had this thing called card entry method. So it's a, you know, it's a reader, it's a card, credit card reader, so you can take payments with it. And there are many ways in our SDK to enter a credit card. So one of them is to type it in on the UI. Uh, that's called, that was called keyed. You can swipe, uh, swiped. You can put the card in the reader and it's gonna read the chip on the card. And that was named EMV. Uh, who knows what EMV is, is here? Who's heard of that? Yeah, very few hands. Um, the EMV specification is about, I don't even know, it's about credit cards and things that go on with chips. And then contactless, contactless is like tap, right? Uh, but it turns out that contactless is also part of the EMV specification. So, kind of weird. What happened there is that this was just a copy-paste of an internal structure that had been, you know, added over time, over years, so it didn't really make any sense. Um, so it's a typical abstraction leak, 
Uh, and um, instead, we went with something sim simpler, like, okay, well, you typed it in, it's manually enter, that's pretty clear. Swipe, ship, and contactless. The way we found those words is interesting. We didn't make them up. We went to um, the help site uh, of, for our customers, our merchants, and we thought, what are the words that people use outside of Square to describe this, or that we use outside of Square to describe this to normal people? And we use that for our API. So uh, at the end, uh, in the end, this is kind of what we landed on in terms of like the overall SDK. We thought, okay, it's authorization. We're authorizing the SDK. Uh, the reader settings flow. Uh, uh, eventually, there's going to be more reader control, but we started with the UI flow. And then checkout. Checkout was interesting. It was not about just a payment. With that flow, you could split a bill, handle tips, signature, and, and receipts. Uh, there's so many things you can do with it that it had to be more than like just take a payment. Um, so we landed on that. Uh, and the second step, once you have the best words, is to apply them everywhere. And this, it looks easy. It's really, really hard. First of all, there's an Android team and an iOS, iOS team, and you have to cross-review the code to find all the inconsistencies in terms of naming. Then you start looking at class names, method names, Javadoc. We did a really hard exercise. Um, like you could say, well, you're taking a payment, you're charging a customer, you're, uh, char you know, you're doing so many ways, a started transaction, there are so many ways to describe the same thing. We thought we need to use the same sentence to describe the same thing everywhere in the doc. Also, similar documentation on iOS and Android, which is also really hard because there are no good tools for synchronizing that. Um, Setup guides, tutorials should all use the same words. And finally, uh, restructure the SDK around those concepts. Instead of one big ball of mud, how can we split the things to uh, make sense? So in that context, now you kind of get it, uh, we had the checkout part, the authorization part, and the, the reader part. So we created managers. <laughs> Not a big fan of the word manager, to be honest, but we <laughs> couldn't find a better word. Uh, so sometimes you have to go with that because it wasn't a controller, it wasn't a presenter, it was a thing, and I didn't want to put thing, so we went with manager. Um, so here, it's always, it's very consistent. I always start with reader SDK dot, and then three options. Am I trying to do checkout things? Am I trying to authorize, do authorization things or reader things? Um, uh, then we kind of pushed everything related to the state of the authorization into another object. So same thing, kind of shoving things around and grouping them together. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that was a bit more verbose, but uh, kind of easier for beginners. You have to write a little bit more code, but it's also easier to kind of explore. Um, then there's another type of consistency. Uh, and so that's platform consistency. It's, if you're writing an Android SDK, you want to be consistent with Android. If you're writing an iOS SDK, you want to be consistent with iOS. If you're writing both and you want to be consistent within each other but also with the platform, that becomes really hard. Uh, you have to figure out, and usually it's hard, but you cannot figure out a logic. It's like if it's domain related, like a payment, then we have to have the same. But if it's technical or about the structure of the code, then we can have something different. A typical example would be maybe you have a callback on Android, but maybe you have a delegate on iOS. Um, you have a view controller and you have. Uh, Activity, fragment, view, presenter, view model, I don't know quite yet, but something like that. Uh, you have Java builders, you have configuration objects. Uh, so uh, that's not the hardest part, but you have to think about it and make sure you, you know, that you're not going with a style that doesn't make any sense for the platform. And then the SDK consistency, so uh, once you're consistent with, you know, in terms of domain and in terms of platform, you also want to have a style that's, uh, that's uh, that goes with your SDK. Uh, you could say, well, just do the Android style. But if you look at the Android APIs, there is not one style in there. There's like many, many, many ways to do things. So uh, that ship has sale, that's fine. But for you, you have to pick something and be consistent. Um, typically, um, uh, you know, it's like the code style, the patterns you're using. Are you using builders? If you're using a builder, is there a build method, a create method? Do you have a constrictor on the builder? Do you have a static builder method? Uh, there's like so many ways uh, to do this. You decide on the rules, find like some logic of some sort, and then you find inconsistencies. Um, and it basically means going through the entire code, class by class, method by method, in the entire API at least, 
and trying to see if it matches the rule. And that's really hard. It's so hard that step three is to find inconsistencies. Again, until, uh, until you're good. And you probably still have a few left. Um, so another aspect of uh, SDK consistency uh, is the, well, in our case, was I, I talked a lot about async stuff. So I said, well, the authorization is like an async state change. It's like you're calling these things before you're logged out or you're not authorized, and then you're calling this, and when it succeeds, you're now logged in, right? So it's async, it happens later. But starting an activity, uh, waiting for a result, is also uh, an, async, uh, U, an async thing. It's a UI flow, you're waiting for a result. Uh, and same thing for the checkout. So we had two entirely different ways to do async stuff. And that's kind of sad. Uh, I kind of want one way. Uh, and Android does not make that easy. Um, so we thought about it, we thought how can we like build a layer on top of act on activity result, kind of hide those low level things that are kind of hard to get right. Um, and I couldn't quite figure, out, figure it out until I looked at the source of Android architecture components. Uh, who uses our architecture components here? Few hands, cool, that's great. So I read the code and gave me an idea. Who's seen um, uh, this class before? It's called holder fragments. Uh, few hands, so uh, it's hidden, it's not for you to use, but it's always interesting to read the source. So architecture components have this thing called view model and view models, and they're amazing because they let you survive objects on, on configuration changes, right? And all of that, all of that magic, that this fantastic thing, it just relies on this thing called uh, holder fragments, um, which is just a retained fragment that's going to stay around and it's going to keep the view models around in memory. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, and I was like, this is interesting. We can probably use that, especially when I remembered that uh, fragments can receive activity results. Uh, so fragment, the fragment API has a start activity for results, and when you start activity for, from a fragment, then only that fragment will receive the activity results later. Um, so it's great because it, you basically, if you sneak in a fragment, uh, you can build a layer to, uh, you know, kind of isolate the API from the uh, start activity for results slash on activity results API. Um, so there's kind of an irony in this because fragments kind of save the day. Uh, we put fragments in our in our API or, or in our SDK. And I think four years ago, I wrote this blog post saying no one should use fragments like ever. And then, and then now I'm putting fragments back in our SDK. So. Uh, I guess that's, that's life. Um, so, okay, we know we can build an abstraction layer on top, right, on top of our API. And uh, we want something that's kind of async. So ideally, we have something that's consistent, that's async, and can react to things happening, and also adapt to life cycle, and you kind of like start listening, stop listening. So what do you think? What do you think is the right solution for this? Anyone? Ah, uh, async task. No. <laughs> um, could be. Um, anyone else? Live data. Cool. That's my second example. Uh, the, the, I haven't heard RxJava, but I assume that's something that's on your mind. Uh, who, who's uh, using R RxJava today? Yeah, quite a few. Ah, okay, cool. So. You could use Arc Java, uh, expose observables. It's very nice because you can subscribe and subscribe. It's super flexible. Uh, and uh, I mean, Arc Java is amazing. The problem is we were targeting people who just learned Android. And when you like come out of a bootcamp, something like Arc Java is probably way too complex for you. Very scary. Lots of methods on those uh, observable uh, classes. Um, so we couldn't use that. Live data was the second thing we looked at. Uh, how many people use live data in an app today? Cool. Uh, that's, yeah, nice. That's uh, about 10, maybe 10, 15 people. Um, when I looked at it, I couldn't figure out how to make something that worked nice for what we were trying to do. Um, and I, it's way simpler than RxJava. It's still kind of a reactive model. Um, and we decided we were kind of like, things were moving fast on the live data front, and we thought we should stay away from that because it wasn't quite figured out yet. So maybe 
we could make our own reactive library. Like, who cares? We can make something better, right? Because we're square. Uh, so we didn't do that. Uh, that's a terrible idea. Don't do it. Um, we, oh, there's a typo. We did something else. Uh, we created uh, just simple callbacks. We need a callback API. But we just made them clearable. And we did that in a way that would allow anyone to build on top very easily to use Rx Java, live data, whatever you want. Um, so the, uh, the example here, uh, to kind of walk you through it, it's uh, you're getting this manager thing, and you're like, OK, now I want to, from your own create method, you want to say, you say, I want to add a callback to this thing for this operation. And you pass in a callback, and you get a callback reference. And then in undestroyed, you clear the callback reference. Um, so that works great because, for us, it worked great because then our, our example code is just one activity with this. There's no libraries, nothing else, it's just that, and so it's kind of easy to follow. Um, and we can write ex 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 example code that's exemplary. Um, and then, and that's where it gets interesting. And so it's very, actually very easy to use from a view model. You just uh, call clear in your uncleared in your view model. Uh, you can easily make a, a, a wrapper with Eric Java. Uh, and then we had, a, a, the way you start a checkout is you call this method that takes uh, the activity and then when you call it, it's going to install the retain fragments so that it can start listening for the results. Um, and then the retain fragment will stay until the activity is, is, uh, is gone uh, and survive configuration changes. Um, that's what the API looks like. Uh, there's something that's kind of interesting here. You, you can see that the first param is context instead of activity. So we had to make a trade-off here. Uh, I do, if, you put act, if you put context, people can pass any context, including the application context, and that won't work for us. Uh, but on the other hand, we wanted the flexibility of being able to use that in, say, a view or anywhere you want. So we do this thing where we unwrap the context and call uh, basically base context, base context until we find an activity. And if we don't find an activity, we throw an exception. It's kind of sad, but it gives you more flexibility. And it was important because we know that in our app, we want to pass uh, a context and we don't like manipulating activities because that tends to also introduce leaks. Uh, so the reader part was exactly the same. Uh, not very interesting. And similar, the, the man, uh, authorization part was exactly the same. So at the end, you have one API that looks the same, even though one is about UI, the other one is not about the UI. They're all async, and they all, all have the same async API. Uh, you could use that trick to do your own versions of like Rx Java async APIs, I think. It's an interesting uh, idea that they had in, uh, in, the, in the architecture components to use a fragment to kind of uh, get under the hood. So, we, we basically, so we talked a bit about consistency and how that's very important for uh, building an intuitive product. Um, let's, uh, let's move on now. Let's talk about errors. Um, so there are two kind of errors uh, when you build a mobile SDK, especially when it has UI. Expected errors, um, so that's when uh, you know, for example, the network is down. Like, it's an error that's going to happen no matter what. You write the perfect, the most beautiful code in the, uh, in the world, and it's still going to have this error happen sometimes. Uh, maybe an application's not installed, something's missing. And uh, a usage error, someone made a mistake. Uh, that means someone wrote, a developer wrote incorrect code, uh, and we thought, this is a very different kind of error, because it's not an error that we want someone to expect. We don't want them to say, oh, I expect that I messed up, and so if I messed up, I'm going to do this and do that in code, right? We don't want that someone to write specific code against mistakes. So an example would be uh, you have this authorized error code, and we had like no network, that's an expected error, and usage error. Uh, we started with, I think, developer error, and then we switched to usage error. It's kind of a mind trick. Uh, you don't want to blame people. You don't want to say, you know, you're an idiot. Um, so you use names that make it sound like it's not the end of the world and it's not really your fault. Um, so uh, this is how you would handle it. Essentially, uh, you just say, okay, uh, you know, this thing happened. I'm going to have a specific use case for it. This other thing happened. Well, I, I'm going to have a generic way to handle it because this is not something that should ever happen. But maybe I, I did a mistake. Um, and the interesting part was that our result error object, uh, so it was generic based on this, so that, that's the, the C is the enum here. Um, and so uh, it's one of these uh, two values, no network or usage error. And then we had three fields, and that's where it's interesting. We would provide a message 
that is for people to display. And that is for the developer to display in the UI. So that's something for, to show the user. And then we had a debug code and a debug message. And they're named on purpose because they should only be shown in uh, debug logs and analytics. And the key idea is that we never want to show a customer uh, some weird error message, right? So in the case of a usage error, the message would be something like, oh, uh, an error happened, please contact the developer. And then we would append just a code at the end. And so that way they could take a screenshot or contact the developer and pass that, and then the developers could search from that on Google and find the explanation. Um, so let's talk about preventing mistakes. So the first way to prevent a mistake is to make sure it never happens. Uh, to design your API so that you can't make the mistake. So for example, in, the, 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 in the, the slide we saw before about passing a context, if we change the type to activity, then you would never be able to pass another context. Um, we made that trade-off, but you, know, you could change that. Uh, another one is education, right? Teach people how to do the right thing, teach them the right concepts. And rep repetition, teach again and again and again until it gets in. But the problem is, especially with all of us developers, we quickly get bored. And if there's like a page, we're like, okay, I'm gonna write 10 pages. If you read all of that, you're not gonna make any mistake. No one's gonna read the pages, everybody's gonna make mistakes. So you have to figure out what is the minimum amount of information that you need to learn. Um, the other way, so let's assume a mistake happens. What can we do about it? Uh, so if a mistake happens, we need to provide a feedback loop to help them um, kind of fix it. And there's a hierarchy of feedback loops, right? So what is the best time to let a developer know that they made an error? The best, best, best time, aside from never happening, is typing time. It's what my ID does when it tells me, oh, you can't pass that right now because it's the wrong type. Uh, best time ever. Uh, something like Lint helps a lot with that uh, because it's like, as you type, it tells you about bad, bad things. The problem with Lint is that it tends to, you have to be very careful because if you over constrain, if you over detect things and you're like, oh, you shouldn't do that and, and the person is like, no, actually that's, in that case it's fine, uh, quickly it becomes a lot of noise and people just don't pay, even pay attention to it anymore, right? Like, I assume all of you have sometimes kind of like stop looking at warnings and moving on. Like, I, I know what this is. And then you miss a mistake. Uh, the second time, uh, second one is build time. Uh, for example, Dagger giving you uh, compilation errors. Uh, the third one is like on app startup in debug. Usually you're gonna catch, catch that. It's a little late. You're gonna be a little angry, but you're gonna, you're gonna catch it. App runtime, when the feature triggers, that's uh, in dev, uh, in debug, that's good. Uh, that's, but that's not great. It only works if you have manual tests or some, UI, some test automation. And the worst one is production. Uh, and that's where usually most of them happen. And we don't want that, right? So, uh, so let's try to, it's really nice if you can provide error feedback earlier. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, finding API design issues. You've made an API, you're like, it's the best of the world, I think it's great. But maybe I could get some feedback on it, right? Because the, the problem is, when you write an API, you're, you're not going to say, I'm going to write this wrong. You're writing what you think is right. So uh, you're probably not going to see any issues with it. So there are many ways, right? You could ask for customer feedback. You could look at Stack Overflow questions. What are people confused about? Uh, you could look at crashes. What are the common crashes? What are common mistakes that people make? Uh, one of the ways that are actually very cheap, and we don't do it enough. We need to do it more. Uh, as as engineers, it's something that's very, very obvious. Uh, it's called usability testing. Uh, and it's a big word for something very stupid. You ask someone, uh, bring them in a room with their permission, and ask them to, uh, to try it using your SDK, write some code against it, and you just stand there and you say nothing. That's all you gotta do. And you take notes, maybe. And you record the, the screen in the conversation, but that's it. I mean, recording, you can do it with Hangout, whatever, taking notes, that's easy. The big, big, big thing is, A, you need to be there in person. If you ask someone for feedback, they might give you good feedback, but most of the time they're gonna say, oh, it's fine, I had an issue with this, uh, but you're not gonna get the whole context of what happened. And the other big thing is, let them make mistakes. I've, <laughs> it's really funny, when you see them doing it, you're like, no, 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 don't click here. Don't do that, let them make the mistake, record it, and then you can talk about what happened and try to figure out what happened. Another one that's pretty big is like when someone says, oh, sorry, it was my fault, I didn't pay attention. That's to me, that's a, that's a trigger. I know 
something went wrong. It's not that they didn't pay attention. It's we put too much information or we didn't structure it right. There's something there that we can improve. Uh, one of the, and, so, and then you can fix it. So one of the issues we had was that uh, we had a dependency on the support library, but only a subpart of it. And that's a common issue with dependencies where you, you, know, you depend on, on a part of something and then they add a dependency to some other part of the support libraries with a different version. And so that's gonna update everything that depends on it to be the same version, but the stuff that you added but that they didn't add is gonna be in the old version and you get weird runtime crashes. So after we got that, initially we're like, well, they should just fix their dependencies. Uh, it's not easy though, so we, we just uh, bailed and gave them in the documentation, we gave them the code to override it and put the right version of the support library uh, and, and that was it. Um, so finally, uh, another one that's really interesting to look for is something called a deliberate violations. So if you're in your library or your API, you say, do not do this. And then uh, you see someone writing the code that does the thing. Your reaction might be, might be like, well, I told you not to do it, what happened? Uh, but the reality is they wanted to do something and your API was not designed right or was missing features and so they had to work around it. So it's a really interesting signal. Um, we used to write a spy fragment when we had fragments to fix some fragment issues and go around the API. That was a clear signal that something was wrong with the fragment API back then. So uh, in conclusion, if you're interested in this, so can you kind of summarize, right? Like the most important thing is consistency. Uh, think about errors and whether, uh, th how the developer should get the error feedback. And then I just wanted to highlight, because this is a very, very large uh, topic. Uh, so Just Blush has a lot, a lot of great content on this. Uh, Florina gave a talk last year. It's available on YouTube. It's really interesting. I really advise you to watch it. There's also a talk from Tao Dong uh, about API usability in Flutter, where they, they did a bunch of really interesting things in Flutter that are worth reading about, even if you don't really like Flutter. Um, and finally, it kind of not, has nothing to do with uh, computer science. The design of everyday thing is kind of, the, I think, one of the founding books of UX. And you can read it and think, well, how does that apply to APIs? And you, get, you come up with interesting things. And with that, that's it.